Have you ever been told that speaking in tongues is not for today? Maybe you've heard people speak in tongues and it seemed weird. You thought to yourself, this is too strange to be God. Or maybe you believe that people can still speak in tongues today, but that it's not for everybody. everybody. Whether you're skeptical or intrigued, whether you speak in tongues or don't, my new book, Nine Lies People Believe About Speaking in Tongues, is the book for you. Get your copy wherever Christian books are sold and head over to cbremner.com and click on the first link on the homepage for more information about how you can spread the word. Enjoy the show. Dropping some knowledge. And a little love. And a little love. This this is the Fire on Your Head podcast with your host, Steve Bremner. Steve Bremner. Steve Bremner, missionary to Peru and blogger at stevebremner.com. The podcast where we tackle gray areas your pastor doesn't talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Bremner. Greetings and welcome to Fire on Your Head. And I'm excited. I'm excited today because I've got the one and only Larry Sparks. Not the country musician, but uh, the author and revivalist and itinerant preacher. Lately I've been been doing some recordings and uh, this was, was the third one I recorded uh, in the last week. But I'm gonna uh, I'm I'm airing it first today. I uh, recently had Dave Edwards on the show again, and the other day I recorded a, recorded an interview with the the lovely Amber Picota, who's who's also got a book coming out with Destiny Image this July. And uh, I recorded with Dave first, then Amber. And uh, at the time I'm making this intro, I had just recorded yesterday with Larry, and I I decided to reverse the order I published these in, so. Uh, uh, I still got those other two coming up, but uh, my time with Larry was great. And even though we just spent an hour talking to each other, and it was the first time we'd we'd really talked to each other before. It felt like I'd known I'd known him longer. So uh, uh, we we covered the Holy Spirit, we covered revival, we covered the presence of God, and it was some great stuff. And uh, so before before we get going into that, I I, I want to kind of share something on my heart. Not only just because it's on my heart, but because I think it'll it'll you know help us segue a little bit. It's kind of like a long-winded introduction for today's episode. And anybody who lives in a third-world country uh, knows the struggle of having to lower your standard when it comes to eating at local restaurants, uh, especially what would be the equivalent in North America of a, a mom and pop restaurant. Uh, you know, like in our culture. Waiters are paid next to nothing, and they live on tips. And as a result, the whole system has this built-in process that motivates them to do a good job serving the customer so they will receive that tip. Uh, Never mind that you should already be tipping uh, or not bother going to a restaurant. But anyway, here in Peru, uh, unless you're going to some high-end touristy area of town, you know, the waiters and the waitresses don't expect you to tip uh, maybe that's the problem. <laughs> I don't know, but or maybe it's the fact uh, the customer is never right. You know, I don't. I don't know. But anyway, it's a lot different of an experience than than when you're in North America or maybe even Europe. In North America, if we feel that we've received lousy customer service, we just blast it on Facebook or tweet about it or leave a negative review on Yelp, whether we're in the right or not, and it can result in a public relations disaster for the restaurant if it goes viral. Years ago, I went to um, Tarma, which it, all you need to know about it is that it's about five hours by bus into the mountains. My friends Martine and Denise had invited me to come do some preaching in their mission up there for the weekend, and they drove me and an American intern they had back to Lima the following Monday. I remember we parked and went to a street in downtown Lima in a main block where there's no shortage of restaurants, traffic, and every other aspect you expect to encounter in the center of a big city metropolis. We picked some side street not far from where we parked, and we were seated at the table, the four of us, and we were presented a menu, and the waiter disappeared for a few moments to allow us time to make our selections. I don't remember what kind of restaurant this was or what they specialized in, but I do recall we were all scanning the specials. Let's just arbitrarily say there were ten items on this part of the menu, and eventually each of us decided to order something from it. When the waiter came back to take our orders, we proceeded to indicate what we wanted, and one by one he would tell us, 
I'm sorry, but we're out of that. Or, we don't have that today. This happened with maybe like seven of the items that we went through. And I think uh, each of us, or maybe all but one of us, needed to take another moment to pick something else. We then waved him back over and told him what we would have. We continued enjoying ourselves for quite a while. I'm going to say like 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, And then the waiter came up to Denise and started to apologize to her. And he proceeded to tell her that what she had ordered also wasn't available. And he wanted to know if she would like to, yet again, order something else. We had been there maybe half an hour or more. We had been there at least half an hour by this point. And basically, we were being told, after all the time we had waited, that some of our orders wouldn't be ready. The reason this particular experience sticks out in my mind is because I remember the waiter didn't even seem embarrassed or concerned that we thought this was unacceptable, laughable even, that a restaurant would let its patrons sit for probably half an hour by this point before telling them that what they were hoping for or waiting for wasn't available. That this even needed to be pointed out was appalling. But being the good patient Christians that we try to be, We basically indicated we were going to pay for our drinks and leave. I think we went and got fast food or something instead, since the hour was getting late and we had not planned on stopping at two places just to get one meal. The details of this story stick out in my mind, not because this was the only time such an experience happened, far from it, but because our waiter was particularly oblivious to how off-putting this was for us and that as a result, we'd probably never come back to this restaurant again after an experience like that. We were hungry, stopped in this one particular restaurant out of probably a hundred in that area, and they didn't have what we came for, the food that they advertised on their menu. We weren't picky or anything, but to go through about six, seven, or maybe eight items on the menu out of ten they were promoting and not be able to get any of them, makes me wonder how such a restaurant would stay in business. I don't mean to be bashing on Peru or this culture either, but my wife and close friends look at me with chagrin whenever we experience lousy service like this. In the recent months before Christmas, Lily and I discovered an Italian restaurant in the hole in the wall near the park I take our daughter to every afternoon. I forget which one of us tried it first, but we started finding ourselves there on a more regular basis, like once a week. They offered pizza, pasta, and the Peruvian interpretation of tacos. I use that word loosely because every time I ordered them, I wondered who it was that considers these to be tacos. We made a mental note of their store hours, which was easy to do since they were only closed on Mondays, and their sign said 12 p.m. to 11 p.m. each night of the week they were open. We'd find ourselves there at 2 p.m. on an open day, and they were closed. We would find ourselves there anyways because the food was very delicious but also economic, which is a code word for cheap. Then we started noticing something. We would sit there for a few minutes trying to keep Jemina from acting up, and then when we were finally ready to order, we'd give them our request and be told, Oh, we don't have that today. It took several visits before I ever got to try their so-called tacos because on more than one occasion, they told me they didn't have any flour and couldn't prepare the tortilla wraps they had made for this dish. (sighs) Another time just before Christmas, we had moved from our apartment into a new one several blocks away and hadn't plugged our fridge in and decided on going to this restaurant to get some gourmet pizza, only to find... You guessed it, they didn't have any that day. Never mind that the very specific thing they advertise themselves as is an Italian pizza restaurant with bright light red letters above the entrance that flashes the word pizza, but yet they didn't have any. I didn't know whether to laugh or cry, and if I'd experienced it once, I've experienced it dozens of other times where I've been at Chinese food or Chifa restaurants here with terrible service. Ask me about the time I had a metal staple in my chicken fried rice. But anyway, eventually I gave up on this particular restaurant because despite the close proximity to our house and the price, if they were actually going to have the food they advertised, uh, but they don't. So it brings me to the point I'm building toward. Yes, Steve does have a point. 
Do you have what you advertise? If you're a believer in Christ, you are wall-to-wall Holy Ghost. If you're a member of His bride, the Bible says that you can and will do these works. What works? The works Jesus did and greater. Mark chapter 16 talks about how these signs shall accompany them that believe. You know, they'll lay hands on the sick, cast out demons, speak in new tongues, etc. So, can you? When people in your life, whether it be your neighbors, co-workers, or, or any kind of acquaintance, need a healing in their body, or a loved one they know needs prayer badly, and they bring them to your doorstep, do you provide the goods? Or do you say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't have any prophetic words to give you today. Have a nice day. You cannot give what you don't have. Today in my discussion with Larry Sparks, we joke about how fire on your head's reason for being, uh, that I've been saying for the last year or two, is to kick people out of the upper room. But as Larry gently points out, there's a time and a place for the upper room. Jesus told his disciples not to leave Jerusalem until they were clothed with power from on high because you can't give what you don't have. Jesus said we would do greater works than him and that doesn't come without the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which is a baptism in power. Jesus knew the disciples weren't going to be able to turn the world upside down without power. They weren't going to do it by being able to preach good sermons, tell good stories, and have three points in a poem. It's the same with us if we're going to follow in the Messiah's footsteps. You and I need the power of the Holy Spirit. And that topic and revival are what Larry burns with and shares with us in this week's episode. So without any further ado, let's get into my discussion with Larry Sparks. Enjoy! I'm doing good. Good. Do you do these through a video? No, they're they're audio podcasts, so you don't need to see me. <laughs> um, I don't need to see you. If, yeah. If you if you'd like to have video on, hold on, I'm turning my video on. If you'd like, uh, we could see each other. Uh, okay. I just recorded on Friday with uh, Amber Picota. She's yeah. Another, yeah. And we left the video on like the whole time to see each other, and. There was there was almost nothing to edit out of it. Yeah. So I'm ba- I basically think I'm going to do something with the video. So it's up to oh, you. Okay. It's up to you. I mean, if if your hair's the way you want it to be or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. My own. We're we're getting ready to move, so I have a lot of stuff in here that um you know my light used to be a little bit better, but it can get a little wa- looked a little yeah. washed out. So well, the main um, the main thing is having and and just so you know, I I started the call recording and and I'll edit out stuff that's. Okay unrelated or whatever uh but just because you're short for time for how i normally do these and um and uh the the priority is the audio uh the the, keeping the video after the last interview that was an afterthought once i started to see that nothing went wrong that i needed to to edit (laughs) that's like i could probably use this video for youtube or something yeah yeah. so um so so how are you doing I'm doing well. I'm doing well. It's a it's a busy season. We're actually getting ready this weekend. We're having a revival conference after with John and Carol are not. Yeah, so, I know so. who they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're they're. We love them. We love them, and we're looking forward to having them down here with us. So yeah, just I, getting ready for that. Yeah, that sounds great. I uh, you know, like I told you, I read your your faith book. I know you've got more books, and I and I looked at your article last night, and I. I read your email carefully, and I thought that this is perfect. Um, yeah. You know, because that fire on your head, we're all about, like I say, kicking people out of the kicking believers out of the upper room. You know, yeah. go, go yeah. do stuff with the power. The you know, and whether that's outside of the four walls or whatever. But uh, and um, and uh, we kind of been trending a lot lately with people who are done with church or done yeah. with the system, or whatever. But uh, I really was tracking with uh this article of um lies people are believing about the holy spirit yep. and just other things you said in in your email so i mean what's burning on your heart the most you know that like for the time we have if, yes what would you like to most take advantage of talking about 
I want to talk about the Holy Spirit because, you know, it's one of those things where for a long time, revival has been my passion. And, you know, so many different people have different perspectives on revival. There's this idea that, number one, it's, I call these kind of the new covenant people. And, you know, you and I, we're new covenant people, but they believe that, well, we don't really need to be praying for revival right. because we already carry the spirit of revival, Holy Spirit. So, I, I, and I actually 100% agree with that. We carry the spirit of revival, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, lives inside of us, which means revival should be a normative thing. The thing right. that we call revival should be normal Christianity. I'm grateful for people, uh, again, like Jonathan Welton. I'm grateful, for, I'm grateful for voices like that, but really challenging us in that regard, saying, hey, this is what normal should look like. Right. Um, at the same time, though, and I believe this is how the kingdom of God works, just, as, just in the same way you can have Arminianism and Calvinism, and I do believe there's some sort of divine intersection for stuff like that. I believe there's this intersection of those who, okay, we walk out revival is normal. We cast out demons, heal the sick. But I also do believe that there is this, this contending, this kind of prayer. This, you know, they, they talked about it back in the old days, like tarrying in prayer, yeah. contending, travailing. And, and, you know, I used to get uncomfortable by that language until I realized we're not trying to twist God's arm. Right. Um, He's, you know, he's a good father. He's faithful. He, he's not, he doesn't have like a clenched fist around revival and says, you know what? I'll give it to the person who prays the loudest and, and the longest and, and who maybe, you know, is the most passionate and all this kind of stuff. I believe he is so willing. I mean, the Spirit's been poured out already on the day of Pentecost. But, you know, here's the reality. Even though we all carry that Spirit of God inside of us, you know, Bill Johnson revolutionized my life when he talked about this idea of hosting the presence mm. of God, the one who lives inside of us, resting upon us. And maybe that's the thing we're missing. Sure. Um, I, I, I want that. I know he lives inside of me, and I'm grateful for that. But, you know, I can't deny these seasons in history where God broke in an unusual power, like in Wales and Azusa Street, the latter rain revival, and, you know, the, the Great Awakenings, where there was these unusual seasons of visitation and I look at those and I get challenged because I think to myself, okay, God, why weren't they sustained? I mean, all of them, you know, even up to Brownsville, which, which comparatively was quite long, <laughs> a five-year revival. Um, but even then, I'm like, God, why, why didn't these revivals sustain? Um, but it's one of those things where, and, you know, and Dr. Michael Brown talks about this, and, and I agree, you know, those unusual dramatic visitations of God are intended to actually bring us out of that place of complacency and bring us into normal. Right. Um, and so I guess what I'm all that to say in all the context is there, there is no pursuing revival. There's no pursuing the outpouring of the Spirit. There's no pursuing this normal Christian life unless, once again, the church, corporately, individually, we become okay with the Holy Spirit again. And when I say okay with the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm, I wrote that article that you mentioned, Steve, and I'm in, in the process of kind of contemplating a book about the same topic because I'm so grieved by so much of what the church, and when I say the church, a lot of the charismatic and even Pentecostal church has put the Holy Ghost in the back room. Yeah, um, and, and you know I, I agree with you on that, <laughs> you know, with, with uh, you know? having put out a book to try to encourage more people, in especially That's charismatic circles, with speaking in tongues. Um, and I, I don't know how long ago it was I heard someone quote like George Barna saying something like only 25% of Pentecostal charismatic people like say they've ever spoken in tongues. And I'm like, well, what about in the past when, when like the assemblies of God or these different denominations, this was kind of like typical and you didn't really need to argue about if it's the sign or, or not. But um, yeah. to, 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 to get back to what you were saying a minute ago about the, like there's the tension or the balance between not striving, but yet and striving yeah. for me, uh, like I, I, I find myself constantly trying to figure out how to how to navigate it because I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm in some circles where, oh no, no, everything's been done, and then you know, I, I went to fire, I, I was under Dr. Brown and stuff, and so I know that that um, contending and 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 pressing in, and um, sometime recently, I think what the Lord showed me was out of Exodus with with Moses and and uh, the Israelites that God provided the manna, like they did nothing for the manna to, to be made available to them, but they had to get up in the morning and go get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like God basically did all the work and gave it. But like, yeah. if you slept in till noon 
Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? There was yeah. no man. There was no man on the ground for you to go get. You know what yeah. I mean? And so there is a, a, an initiative on our part, but also a, like, yeah, he has done it all on his part too. Uh, yeah. And and he, he lays out like some conditions. He lays out how it works, and you just go and yeah, it's it's work going and collecting mana in the morning. You know? Uh, you know that that in analogy is imperfect, but it 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 has like that balance between the two the two things, right? The the initiative on our part and the part where God did it all, right? Yeah. yeah. So um, yeah, this is good. You're getting my juices going, and we've only only been talking like eight minutes. <laughs> you know, uh, but so, plenty to talk about. Yeah. So um, so um, okay. Well, uh, just just for some context for me, because uh, uh, we this is our first time talking. Um, I went. I, I come out of Peterborough, Ontario, where oh. um, there's this Bible college. And, and I have a reason for why I'm going around circle with this for you. Sure. Um, and in, in, in the 90s, late 90s, my last year of high school, me and some friends, we would we would go like 6.30 in the morning. Um, we had access to a lecture room in this Bible college. In those days, it was called Eastern Pentecostal Bible College. Changed its name to Master's College and Seminary. And... And knowing what was going on at Brownsville, knowing what was going down in Pensacola, uh, you know, we were praying for a revival for like an hour before school every morning. And, um, you know, and, and this is like kind of before Facebook and before really like the internet, like we had internet, but not like now where you could just watch YouTube streaming of stuff and whatever. So, um, you know, we'd be months behind on like whatever videos had come out of revival and stuff. Yeah. And the, and then the guy who took over that uh, seminary, uh, in, in the next few years, moved it to Toronto, and his name is Evan Horton. Oh, wow. <laughs> and okay. and um, so, like, I remember sitting at a desk in uh, the, in the Netherlands. I was there for, like, a year, year and a half before uh, I, I wound up in Peru. That's another story, another podcast. And I remember, um, you know, the news came out that uh, Pastor Randy Feldshaw had resigned or moved on. And they were getting a new pastor. And I remember just logging into Brownsville that day and seeing Evan Horton, you know, had been uh, selected or become the pastor. And I'm reading these things about different locations in Ontario that I know. And I'm like, well, isn't that interesting coincidence? You know what I mean? Like, like I don't think he's from my city. I, I couldn't tell you these details about his life. Yeah, but yeah. And so there, there's, there, it's funny to me how these different little connections piece together. And, and I don't know John Arnott or anything. I've, I've been to the airport a few times. Um, but like, you're going to be there on Saturday. And so I just, yeah, when, yeah. when I see these little connections that like piece themselves together, I like, you know, going where the ball is rolling and, 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 yeah. and invite people like you to talk or, or connect. Yeah. And, um, so, you know, and then at the same time, I've got these connections and friends where, um, there, there is that strong emphasis where people are like, no, 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 no. We had some extremes in these things and, and the pendulum is kind of hit really hard the other way. And, um, and so, however you want to navigate this, what in, what in particular, or, or, you know, where do you want to start, you, you feel are, are things that, like, you know, we need to get back to, or, or we, you know, we, we started good, and then we've kind of veered off tr- track when it comes to whether it's contending for revival, or whether it's flowing in signs and wonders, and, and giving that place to the Holy Spirit. Uh, however your mind is racing with, uh, with these, these comments I'm making. No, it, it's very interesting because my mind is very streamlined. I, I think more than any other time in my life or ministry, um, you know, my first encounter with God, July of 1999, and I went to an evangelical Christian school, you know, fifth grade, twelfth grade. I, I probably got saved several times. Uh, I mean, this is all. I, this is all. I'm sure you'll be, you'll you'll get a kick out of this, but it's true. I, I didn't want to go to hell, and I certainly didn't want to miss the rapture. Those two <laughs> things that I'm like, all right. Could, I mean, it was that kind of context of a school. So, again, they would have spiritual emphasis weeks. I give my heart to the Lord. I raise my hand. I pray the prayer. I learned a lot of information about God, but I remember July 1999, I went to a local church where that my wife and I still go to down here in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida, uh, Christ Fellowship. And, it, you know, non-denominational church, uh, it's moved in a more charismatic direction, but back then it was very revolutionary to me because, you know, these people would clap during praise and worship. They'd have instruments. People would raise their hands. I thought it was strange, crazy, but I was drawn to it. I was drawn to the teaching. I wanted, you know, the Lord just really around that time, um, I'd say sovereignly awakened a curiosity in my heart for the things of God. So I, as soon as I got my driver's license, I would go to this church, but I'd go intentionally after praise and worship, right? 
just that's just str- it was just strange to me. I didn't I didn't hate it. It was just weird. But one one Saturday night, I remember I was there for praise and worship, and in the middle of praise and worship, I I didn't provoke God. He provoked me. He came and he touched me. And, I, you know, I just, during the midst of the song, I remember my hands starting to tremble. I remember feeling like a fire, or like a warmth. And this was all physical. This was not stuff I needed faith to feel. This was all physical responses. You know, I didn't fall down. I didn't have a dramatic reaction at that point. But I remember it was so subtle. But I knew, because I'd never felt God before. I'd never known God was tangible, that God was interactive, you know, interactive. But he came near and that one very subtle encounter, it, I, I'm living where I am today, doing what I'm doing today because of that one encounter, um, a drawing from that well. Of course, I've had to sustain that. Of course, I've had to, you know, there's discipleship and all that. But that, that, that basically has become the basis for what I preach and, and feel led to give my life to, which is connecting people with an opportunity to encounter God, whether it's through preaching, whether it's through an event. You know, we, we obviously we don't need more events. We don't need more meetings. We, you know, I'm convinced we don't even need, we have so many sermons. We have so much teaching. All of that's good if it contributes to an atmosphere where somebody can truly encounter the Spirit of God. And, you know, you're talking about what, what, what's kind of on my mind, what's on my heart. Um, as far as in order to see revival, in order to see this normalization of signs and wonders, in order to see us be the church that we look, you know, in the book of Acts, and even the first 300 years of church history, more or less, normative was the power of God. Normative were people being baptized in the Spirit. Normative, I mean, this was, it was not the exception. So in order for us to get back to that place, I do believe we need to welcome the Holy Spirit without restraint, and that terrifies us. Terrify, terrifies even Charismatics and Pentecostals. We've gotten maybe the last 10, 15 years to a place where we've gained some kind of acceptance. Not, not necessarily for our, you know, our pneumatology, our beliefs on the Holy Spirit, but we've gained an acceptance because we've started to look like everybody else. Right. I was, I was going to mention that. Are you making me think of this? Um, how often I meet people that I would consider Charismatics or I would think, you know, when, when I was more evangelical, that they were a part of these streams. And... I'll meet them and, and they've, they, they aren't familiar with the prophetic or, or, yeah. or prophesying. They aren't, they aren't familiar. They've maybe never laid hands on the sick yeah. or, they, or they, they may, may have spoken in tongues, but they, they really don't, aren't sure. And, um, yeah. and how often I, I, I meet people who, who are just, you know, died in the wool, charismatics or Pentecostals, but this stuff is, is unfamiliar to them. And, and I feel like, you know, I, I grew up evangelical and, but I've been in these circles for, like 15 years now or what, since I, since I went to fire basically. And, um, and so I still have aspects where I feel like I'm new to this. And so I'm surprised when I meet other people who are like, I have something to tell them or, or teach them or, or that, that, that even a book, you know, came out of me into existence to, to, to impact people with. And, um, so I, I think I agree with you that if I, if I understand what you're saying, that we have become as, as a broad general whole, we have yeah. become a lot more like, um, everybody else. And maybe, and maybe that's why, um, you know, that's why I like that George Barna study that said like, uh, 25% of only 25% of, of, you know, these people in these certain circles can say they've ever, you know, operated in, in certain gifts of the spirit, despite that, that's kind of like what we're supposedly known for. (laughs) You know what I mean? That's a low percentage of the population if that's what we're known for, you know? So, well, and it's interesting, and it's, you know, I, this, this tends to rattle a couple of cages when I use this kind of information, but, um, you know, Rachel Held Evans, who's a blogger, uh, you know, a writer, an author, I read her r- recent book because it was very interesting to me, and it's called Searching for Sunday. Now, she really has a, a, an outreach to millennials. I, there's a lot that she, she talks about that I don't agree with, but what I do agree with her on and I'm, I'm happy, you know, my, my whole desire is I want to unify with people over what we agree on mm-hmm. rather than, let's, you know, I, I, let's stop being known by the people who are against everything. Right. Yes, we have to have solid convictions. Yes, we are immovable about those things. I'm grateful for voices like that. But with Rachel, what I love is that her book, Searching for Sunday, I believe she's asking all the right questions because there's a generation, millennial generation right now that, you know what, t- to be honest, for for 
for church has gone too long saying, you know, let's bring them in through our show, through our song and dance, through, through our lights, through production value, through all that kind of stuff. And, you know, I always tell people, listen, I'm not against any of that stuff. I'm not against it if it ultimately is secondary to hosting God. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, because somebody once asked me, do you believe in the seeker sensitive movement? I said, I absolutely do. But we've got the seeker wrong. The seeker is not the person. The seeker is the Holy Spirit. So rather than setting a service, setting an atmosphere around a person, let's set the atmosphere around the Holy Spirit. And again, I go back to what I was saying. It terrifies people. But what Rachel is talking about in her book, she says, you know what? The church needs to be weird again. And immediately... So many people are like, what? Church needs to be weird. We want it to be as unweird as possible. We want church to be absolutely predictable. I've gone to so many services where one of the first things the pastor gets up there and says, and I'm not, I'm not criticizing any specific people. This is just culture. They, they'll say something like, well, we've got a great service planned for you. And it's just like, listen, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I, I understand the logistics we're dealing with. I go to a church where we have four services on Sunday, two services on, on Saturday night. I understand there's parking lot stuff. I understand there's kids ministry. I understand all that. But I remember the Holy Spirit, because at one point I was like, I had to repent because I was, I was being one of these crusaders who was trying to take on everything and say, we need to go back to the way it was done. We need to, why are we doing so many services? And the Holy Spirit said, listen, you know, the infrastructure is not the problem, but what we need to do whether if, you know, you, you have two hours and you have one single Sunday morning service or you have four Sunday morning services that are 75 minutes, take the 75 minutes, hold it up to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit's yours. Mm-hmm. We, we've got to live that way, not just with church services, with our, with our lives, with our, with our meetings, with any, any area of the Christian life. It needs to be Holy Spirit because he is the one we have in the earth. You know, Jesus is at the Father's right hand. God the Father is in heaven. We have this precious person called Holy Spirit, and it saddens me that we've, we've basically done everything we possibly can to give him the cold shoulder and almost act like he's the guy that, you know, you know almost like the drunk uncle, that if the Spirit of God, you just don't know what he's going to do. But here's the thing. I do, be, you know, I do believe that there is a decency and an order that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 14. It just looks different than what we think it does. Right. Whenever somebody tells me, uh, I believe God's into decency and order, I'm always curious, like, well, whose idea of decency and order are we talking about? Because because exactly. yeah. your idea, you know, like, for some people, like, um, you know, the Holy Spirit touched me could mean we're sitting in pews with hymn books and while we sang a certain hymn at that moment, I felt like some goosebumps or something, you know, yeah. like somebody could be saying that when they're talking about being, t- so it's like, whose definition are we going by of, of yeah. the Holy Spirit? And, um, you've, I'm sure you've heard revivalist quotes like, um, who is it that's, that's attributed with, um, I just set myself on fire and people come watch me burn. Uh, John West, I think John Wesley. Yeah. yeah. I, I can never remember who said that, but, um, I was talking to someone fairly recently about, how um you know this this particular pastor had uh people could twitter you know during church and and post their their questions on the powerpoint and uh, and that and and he was it, you know it was discussed that that's how you keep people engaged and uh my friend said to me well if you got the holy spirit <laughs> you know you don't need twitter or or whatever you know like if you set yourself on fire people will come watch you burn or you know um there's a pastor i met down here who was who was bragging to me about how well you know we've got free starbucks in the lobby and so that's going to you know draw people yeah. in cuz you know starbucks is is kind of like high end more expensive here than it is in like north america right and i'm like well if you you know like if that's what you need to yeah. to lure people in then that's what you're going to get is people who are after that and yeah. um so i i hear you i i'm i'm tracking with you and um i i actually follow rachel held evans yeah. and yeah. and i feel the same way like i love that she's asking some questions and i'm yeah. just not coming to the same conclusions or or answers or whatever but yeah. at least an appreciation for what she she is trying to do you yes. know what i mean it would be <laughs> you know it'd be cool if we could get her like on fire for like the holy spirit um ima- I, yeah. you know imagine her then you know um well, so and that's the thing it's just like people like that um because for example I, I totally agree with you because her response at least in that book is well we need to go back to the sacraments so we need to go back but and again i'm not i'm not in 100 percent agreement with that 
Um, but I, I see where she's going in the sense we need to go back to something that's tangible, right. something where God can be experienced. And I, I agree with I agree with the thought mode. Um, mm-hmm. and, and you know I do I do pray that she would taste of of what we've experienced as well because it is that's that's what we're going after. We want to experience God again, like like I have, like you have, where where He's not just a concept. He's not just out there somewhere. He is a real God who breaks in with real power. And I, I do long for the day where it's no longer, we've got a great service plan for you. It's, you know what, any, anything can happen because right. he's here and that's okay. So, right. yeah. Don't miss it because you don't know what's going to happen. Yes. You know, don't yeah. let this be the meeting or the occasion or the, week, the day of the week that uh, you weren't here when, when, when something powerful happened, yeah. you know? Yeah. And uh, can you imagine, for example, being the people who were, you know, sick or, or out of town on Father's Day, day 95, you know, uh-huh. if you were part of that church in, yeah. in Pensacola? So, I mean, <laughs> yeah. I th- but I also think there's something to be said about how, um, you know, when you go, like, have you ever watched the video of that, that day with Steve Hill? And, yeah, but you, yes. And yes. it's so, like... I, it's so unlike anything I've ever seen after that day. Yes. Like you would never guess it's the same church, right? You would never, you would. No. And so I think I, anyway, I'm, where I'm going with this is this, that um, there's something to be said now when we have so many people who have pioneered the way for us in different things like Brownsville and Toronto and, and, and Bethel and whatever, that yeah. it surprises me. Um, some things we're, we're not seeing or not experiencing or, or how many people you can meet who have been to these things and still um, they're, they're, they still have more they could touch and walk into and experience. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, to, yeah. you know, to be in, um, you know, Father's Day 1994 and, and talk about revival and, and things like that, you can, you, you sort of can't fault people for not knowing what they might be in for. <laughs> but now, yeah. now there's been so much like, of the fallow ground broken up and people who've been, uh, you know, I, like I know all these missionaries, all sorts of people who are around the world just, just through like the, the fire school, the, the Brownsville stuff, you know, yeah. let alone other people who've come up out of these other movements and stuff. So it's like, now we've got so much going for us. If you want to say it that way, that, yeah. uh, it's like, okay, so, so, so what, what yet do we, lack what what more is there that we're we're still like you know what this is on the plate this is the manna on on the ground you know why are we not going and picking it up uh, yeah i don't know if any of that makes sense i'm just kind of <laughs> flowing so it does and it's one of those things where i i've for for example um I, I think we need to figure out a way where we recognize that revival and this is going to sound a little bit counterintuitive but revival does not grow a church. Revival does not grow the church. Re- when I say grow, it may grow it numerically. But revival, we, we need to understand that there's revival and there's discipleship. And, um, you know, I think sometimes we think that, oh, if we, at our church, if we create this revival culture where we have all these meetings and we have all these people that we bring in and we have these Holy Ghost meetings. And again, I, I mean, listen, up to, up to this point in our conversation, I'm all for that. I, I, but we need to get back to a place in our, in our individual lives. But I'm specifically thinking in the local church, especially these charismatic churches like you're talking about, where we have seen these uh, powerful moves of God. Um, you know, the ones that I can think of that are probably the most prominent and the most healthy, not perfect, but but healthy. I mean, you mentioned Bethel Church. I mean, John and Carol are not who, who I know. Um these are local pastors, you know, Pastor Bill and then, you know, Danny Silk, who, who was previously there, and then John and Carol. They have, they, they are not revivalists. They are pastors with heart to see a, an environment where the Spirit of God is allowed to move. Uh, and they will bring in, you know, Steve Hill was a revivalist. Randy Clark, a revivalist. These guys don't try to be local pastors, really. Um, they, they've had seasons maybe where they did that, but they recognize we have more of an apostolic evangelistic type call. You know, I, I guess all that to say is we need to know our roles. We need to know our roles, stay in our lanes, and the church just needs to operate at that fivefold. I mean, it, how many years have we been talking about the fivefold ministry? But let me ask you this. How many churches, even charismatic ones, really operate in that where the prophets are given an appropriate place? The, the evangelist is raised up in the context of a local church. So I'm saying we need to 
have the meetings where we connect people with really the, the, the violent rushing wind of the Holy Spirit where you have these Bible meetings. But on like a day-to-day, week-to-week basis, we need to raise up these communities, a five-fold ministry where people can be discipled. And, and that's where you start, where, where there's a new normal when it comes to Christianity. Right. We're not seeing that normalization because I believe we, we, we still have that lack of discipleship right. by and large. So, I mean, that would be my observation there. It's, and you, know, you said a key word. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you've ever listened to the podcast before or um, have any familiarity with it, but uh, oh. we have no shortage of, of interviews and discussions about discipleship on this show. And, yeah. and I think in a little while I've kind of been lacking in, in getting people like you on and talking about revival because, um, you know, um, the ministry I'm a part of here in Peru, we're very big on discipleship and, and, uh, and some, you know, to the point where we, we don't want things to be buzzwords for us, but one of our buzzwords is multiplication. You know, that like, we don't want to just, um, uh, you know, like we live in uh, community together. We live in, uh, houses in the same neighborhood and stuff. And, 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 uh, long story, I could, I could fill you in on sometime. And we, we teach and we, we, we live like these things, you know, as we, as we, best as we can when it comes to, um, you know, signs and wonders and prophetic and, and, yeah. uh, leadership and whatever. But we're also big on, uh, fathering and mentoring. We're big on that the students themselves can turn around and be mentoring someone, that they can be discipling someone and, and that that's what we're, we're going for. And sometimes I feel like, I, I have friends and acquaintances and and other missionary friends who who come out of revival circles and I'm like I want to I want to plug them into like this discipleship type of stuff yeah. and then I and then a lot of the people I track with and learn from and whose books I read or, or you know sermons I follow who are like disciple making gurus I want to like plug them into the Holy Ghost <laughs> you know what I mean and get them on fire for like the things of revival and it's like sometimes I feel like to me, it's so obvious that the two go together and then I can have people amen and tell me, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, but I'm like, no, 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 you don't get it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, I, I, somehow we got to plant like a disciple making movement into like these, these uh, fountains, you know, these yeah. rivers and then I, and then, and vice versa. And so I don't know if you're tracking with that, but it's, it's very interesting to me that you, that, that you brought up the discipleship aspect of it. Cause that's a, a big thing on, on this show. I have an easy time getting people on here to talk about that kind of stuff. So. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's absolutely neat. That's one of the reasons, I mean, I started at working with Destiny Image, goodness, about uh, almost four years ago, is I just saw a hole in the charismatic market for discipleship material. No, before I came to Destiny Image, I worked for a Southern Baptist ministry, Adrian, Dr. Adrian Rogers. Um, you know, he had passed away, but his son was taking a lot of his leadership training materials, turning it into curriculum and going overseas and training pastors in Africa and India, creating really discipleship for the disciplers, uh, for the pastors and leaders. Right. So that's where I kind of learned about putting curriculum and discipleship materials together. So, but my heart is for the move of the Spirit. So I learned the information there. I came over to Destiny Image and I saw this wealth of resources between people at Bethel and IHOP and all these places where I think there's a lot of good material out there to train and equip and disciple the body of Christ to see this become more than a mo- a moment, but a movement. You know, right. it's just like, I, I, I love the moments where God draws near. We need them, but we also need movement. I, I love it. Fire, fire on your head. Getting people out of the upper room. Yeah. It's true. <laughs> We, we, now we need, you know, we need both. We need the upper room because there's people who are out there. There's people who are uh, kind of out doing the ministry, but they never had an upper room encounter. Right. I hear and, you. I guess. You know, I guess what I mean is to not stay there and never yes. leave. That's the type of people I'm trying to kick out. I no, you know. Like, then, what can I do to encourage you? You know, spread yes. your wings and fly. Get out. So we're we're in, we're in 100% agreement there. Yeah. But I, I for for the people. Uh, that that is, that is my heart to come alongside and and really offer spirit empowered discipleship material. So I came along with Destiny and we created we took some of these books that have been very transformative by you know Bill Johnson, Chris Vallett, and Randy Clark and turned them into um, to Bible study training curriculum that can be done in a discipleship context. So and certainly that doesn't answer all the questions, meet all the needs, but no. I feel like, you know, we need to get started somewhere. Yeah. And people need to be activated. Otherwise they do we just sit around and we just sit and soak and all that. And right. Get, 
I'm all I'm all for it, but we need to live in this this balance where we all where we receive from heaven, but we release what we receive. Right. Um, otherwise, you know, we just I, I believe that stunts us from growing. We just become fat and happy revival Christians. Right. So, right. So one of, <laughs> yeah. Well, one of our axioms we, we borrow from this guy, uh, his name is Mike Breen, and he's got these discipleship uh, materials and stuff, and, and I got to interview him a, a, a number of months ago, is this idea of information, imitation, and innovation. Mm-hmm. And imitation being, uh, you know, I'm just v- very quickly paraphrasing it, where, yeah, the information gets passed on from, from say, one person to the next but imitation comes in through fathering, mentoring, yeah. uh, being able to interact. And then the innovation comes where, okay, that second generation then goes and, and does their thing with passing that on to the next. And, and the cycle is kind of repeated, you know? And I feel like there's no shortage of information. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's there's so so not a lack of of that. But when it comes to like the the uh, the next two parts of that 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 triangle, you know, the, um, the imitation, uh, you know, like, a a a, pa- a local pastor, w- even with a, a decent sized church still can't like disciple personally, uh, 200 people, you know, like he can, he can maybe his, his, a small circle or whatever, but like if everyone gets activated and everyone is, um, uh, discipling, everybody is taking, like taking on four five, six people or whatever and discipling them in these things, then it doesn't take long before that's a really explosive uh, multiplication movement, and so I feel like this revival stuff is definitely the the good information, you know yeah. what I mean? And then the discipleship part is is in the the uh, what you call it? The, what did I say? Im- imitation, and then the innovation is like you know people, um, you know I, I'm viewing like what you're talking about with with Destiny Image and with with the books and with digital media. And, uh, you know, doing uh, the Voice of Destiny podcast and stuff like that. Um, You know, like I didn't have someone teach me how to podcast or do books or whatever. So, like, I'm taking different stuff and different information that was poured into me and different, you know, things and seasons of my life where people were mentoring me and and innovating and and giving it out in in my capacity and my, um, what do you call it? Uh, you, you mentioned earlier about like sticking to our lanes, you know, yes. like I'm, I'm, I'm running as fast and hard down my lane as best as I know how to. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very pleasantly surprised that we're talking about both discipleship and yeah. revival in this conversation. Cause to me, those things are, are burning passions of mine. And, and I feel like I struggle to, um, communicate clearly, uh, how I see those two things piecing themselves together, you know? I don't know. Is but, any of that tracking with you? <laughs> oh, it, it does. But you know what? I, I think that's a very healthy thing. I think it's healthy for us to struggle through finding language to put to this. Because could it be that this is part of this great move of God that, that you know, we always hear this language. Oh, this is great. But, you know, rather than God being up there being like, you know, I wonder what I'm going to move. I think, <laughs> I think more of it is God looking down at heaven and waiting for his people to move. Uh, you know, that's 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 tends to be my perspective. So I feel like it's very healthy for us to even be having these conversations rather than just going into default mode, which is, all right, well, let's just keep doing our revival meetings and let's just keep doing discipleship and let them be separate. Mm-hmm. I feel like we need to have the uncomfortable conversations of figuring out how to bridge those together. And, you know, I, I feel like God is raising up people who, who are, who 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 are kind of moving in that direction. Right. Well, um, like I told you uh, in our email chats, I, I wasn't coming to this with any any notes or questions or, or things to ask you, but I am curious some more about uh, Destiny Image. I'm curious about how how you wound up getting connected with them. Uh, yeah. I, ty- I typically, you know, when I have guests on, I ask them about their books uh, and okay. anything they, they, were, they were writing. Uh, sure. uh, in your case, you have more than one book, but like, you, I just saw on Facebook you posted um, about that your latest book with with revival and in and, and, yeah. and history. I know you were involved with Kil- Doctor uh, John Doctor Michael Brown and and John Kilpatrick with that Fire Never Sleeps book. Yeah. Um, is there anything of that nature you want to promote? Yeah. You want you want to yeah. let people know about? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I do. I'm, I'm you know it's funny. I, I'm I, I'm a publisher for Destiny Image, so you think I'd be a wonderful promoter for my own material, but sadly it always is, 
you know, you promote everybody else and you're just kind of like, ah, you know, if you buy my stuff, buy it. That's great. But, but, um, no, I'm, I'm very passionate about the, I mean, the new book that I have out, it's called Ask for the Rain. And it's a compilation that we're, we're doing exclusively right now for Lou Engel. Um, you know, Lou has this event coming up uh, called Azusa Now on April, April 9th at the Memorial Coliseum in Los Angeles. And, you know, everybody, like I was saying earlier in the podcast, you know, there's a lot of meetings, there's a lot of events, everybody does these types of things. I believe Lou is a true prophet of the Lord. I, I believe the Lord's really gripped him with a, a burden to see this, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit really, in a, perhaps in a way that none of us can even put language to yet. I know he has a burden. I know he's crying out for something. But sometimes, you know, it's like God wants to do something in the earth. And all you do is have your natural human language to try to express something that God wants to do. And I know what Lou is talking about, but I feel like this might be something, the, the undercurrent of something that we can't even maybe wrap our full mind around. So that's why, as a company, Destiny Images is participating with this. We're giving them like 10,000 books um, just to bless them, for them to sell the book as part of uh, raising funds for this event. So when people get it, they can go through uh, the Azusa Now website and they can pick it up there. And then it'll be available for release, I believe, in May. So you can you can get it then. Um, so, But it's, yeah, ask for the rain what, from that um, scripture in Zechariah. It says, ask for the rain in the time of latter rain. And that scripture is just perplexing to me because I, I believe since the day of Pentecost, it's been raining. That there has been this outpouring of the Spirit. You know, God's not, up, you know, there's no Holy Spirit 2.0 up in heaven somewhere <laughs> wait, waiting just for us to pull him down. Right. The Spirit of God's been released. God's made that very clear. But I do believe uh, it's almost like God's waiting for our invitation. It's strange to think because I believe in his sovereignty big time. But at the same time, he's a collaborative God and he's poured out his Spirit and he's looking for people on earth who are asking and who are wanting to receive what he has already provided. Um, you know, just like the example you used earlier on, which is great with the manna, uh, the Lord gave me this picture of, you know, the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus was there. Uh, Jesus was present. Um, you know, he, wa he wasn't trying, he didn't try to hide himself from her. He didn't, try, but you had this crowd who was around him, and, you know, that crowd could have represented people who are kind of, comfortable with you, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy being part of, of the church, I'm happy being part of Christianity, but there was a woman who recognized that Jesus was the solution to her need, and in that case it was a healing, but he is the solution to our deep need, which is, we do hung, we hunger for the fullness of God, we were created to, to house God, um, we were born again to house God, that's why there's this, just draw within us to encounter the Holy Spirit, so, you know, I love that example. She pressed through. She touched Jesus. Power came out of him. She got healed. And I, I feel like God's raising up people like that, just like the example you used where he provided the manna. You know, Jesus was there. But where are those who will go and actually take the manna? Where are those who will actually go and actually touch the hem of his garment? He's not hiding. He's not, you know, trying to play games with us. He's waiting. And I believe God's just waiting for his people to get so, you know, the, the Lord gave me a word. Um, we've got to get hungrier beyond our history. Hung, hunger beyond your history. There's so many people who, who let their history define their destiny rather than, you know, it's like, well, you know, in my history, it's like, well, I went to this kind of church. Uh, I was taught this about God. I was taught this about the Holy Spirit. And they let their history prevent them from experiencing God um, when, in fact, it's like, how hungry for God are you, how much of him do you want to experience? And if you really want him, he's available, he's there, but there's some stuff we've got to lay behind, and we've got to be willing to accept, God, ex accept and experience God um, with all the unknowns and all the mystery that comes with him, whatever it looks like. And that's, that's why, you know, I wrote the article that you mentioned earlier. I, I want him in his fullness. I want that rushing wind of the Holy Spirit. I want the mess of revival. You know, people are like, oh, I don't want that when people fall down, people are, are trembling, people shaking, people laughing. I want it all. Are there people who do it in the flesh? Are there people who do it to make a charismatic show? Yes. Probably, yeah, of course. <laughs> but then I think of the Heidi Bakers. I think of the people who got touched in a way that if we saw them being touched, 
we'd, we'd be offended. We'd say, why is she on the ground laughing? Why, why is she acting like she's drunk? What, you know what? The proof is in the pudding. And, you know, we've seen over a million people come to Jesus through Irish ministries, mm-hmm. people being raised from the dead. I've met Heidi. I've spent a considerable amount of time with her. Legit, real deal. So I want him because, again, all of our methods are great, and we need the methods and we need the strategies. But without the Holy Spirit, not restrained, not as a dove who we keep in a cage, but Holy Spirit and his fire and his wind, everything that he brings with him, I want his fullness. And again, that's why you know, you're asking me about Destiny Image. I'm, I'm grateful to be connected with that company because since it, you know, born in 1983, uh, Pastor Don Norai, who started it, he, he was really gripped by a vision. You can read about it on the Destiny Image website. Yeah. But he was, he was gripped by a vision to see the unrestricted prophetic word of the Lord go forth. Because at the time, he had a vision where it's almost like there were, I guess, it, people trying to edit what God was saying. Mm-hmm. And, and he said, no, I don't want to do it. Now, it doesn't mean we publish any crazy thing that somebody says. But if we know that this is obviously uh, scripturally validated and there is anointing on this. We need both of those because, again, you know, we don't add to scripture by any means, but if it, if it is in harmony with the nature and the character of God and the nature of scripture and there's this prophetic urgency, this prophetic edge on it for now, that's, that's, what, we, that's what we endeavor to publish. That's the criteria right. we, we evaluate by. So, well, and, and I want to mention something because I didn't want to interrupt you while you were flowing a minute ago. Um, no. about, about you wanted the mess of revival and yeah. uh, and likewise discipleship is messy you know oh. like you know wiping people's diapers and yeah. and f- spoon feeding and and you know watching people stumble and not grow up as fast as we think they should and stuff um and so i mean it's not a mystery to me why you know maybe some people are not as keen on discipleship as as they are soaking and stuff like that because yeah. of the both both things are messy you know when you give birth something is birthed yeah i mean i was there at my my daughter's birth i i not sure i'm keen on being at the in the room for the next one <laughs> you know what i mean like it's just it's messy it was gross and uh um and it was a c-section i wasn't keen on on all the you know uh, yeah. But anyway, I, it wasn't a natural birth. But my point is, um, you know, revi- whether we're talking revival, whether we're talking discipleship, whether we're talking the combination of the two, um, there's there's messes, you know. Yeah. And uh, I think sometimes we want like a sanitized revival where only the good, you know, the the baby just comes out well behaved, uh, fully grown, ready to take on the world. But like yeah. it's a process, takes time. In, in, in both of those analogies. But, um, and so, and fire that never sleeps. I, I, if you have like two or three minutes, whatever, I'm, I'm curious oh. how that, how that came about because, yeah. um, I'm planning on reading that book as well. <laughs> you know, yeah. oh, that, that's one of those things where, um, I, I knew at the time that the 20th anniversary of Brownsville was coming up and I thought to myself, you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Brown, John Kilpatrick, or I, I consider them great uh, fathers and generals of revival. And I thought to myself, you know, I want to sit down with them. I want to talk to them. I want to interview them. And I don't want to just create a book that's a memorial. In fact, there's, uh, I would say, 5%, maybe 10% at most of the book kind of goes back to the Brownsville days. And if it does, there's an intentionality there because I wanted to talk to them and I wanted to glean keys and strategies. How can you sustain revival in your life because so many people even came to Brownsville or Toronto there are people who are legitimately touched um, and you know I've gone over all over the world I mean you can't deny that stuff mm-hmm. but then there are people who got touched powerfully by God fell down shook around did the whole did the whole jig but then they kind of went back to normal and people see that and they think to themselves well if you got so powerfully touched by God then why did you go back to the, just the old way of life so I wanted to really get uh, talk to them and get practical things that they learn from being in the midst of revival that could be transferred to everyday life on how you can sustain hunger, passion, um, that, that revival fire for God in your everyday life. So that's, that's kind of how that book came out. Right. Okay, well, I'm respecting uh, the time frame you gave me for, for okay. chatting. So we're, we're coming to the end of that. Um, I don't have anything in particular uh, that, that I want to ask you more about. Uh, you know, I came at this ready for it to be, uh, sure. I mean, would, would you believe it's been, uh, almost 50 minutes? No, no, no. I, I, this is, this has been fun. It goes by fast, eh? 
Yeah, it does. I, I, I threw then that A for you to, to be Canadian. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, any any last thing you want to throw out there before uh, before we, we get going and do our do our days? Yeah. No, Steve, I'm, I'm just grateful for what you're doing. I'm grateful. Um, just grateful for the, the, the mission of what this podcast is all about. Uh, again, kick, kicking people out of the upper room. I just, I've had that, that imagery and that language on my head kind of since the beginning of this. And I think to myself, man, isn't that what we need? Because the world, the world needs what we've experienced and tasted in that upper room, whatever that upper room looks like mm-hmm. to the listener. Um, yeah. Those moments of God encounters. And it's great. Uh, again, I reiterate, we, we need an upper room. We need to create a church culture that is conducive to an upper room atmosphere right. where the Spirit of God is welcome in power. And we do go into church once again with a sense of mystery, but we need to take what we experience and we need to carry it out of those. Right. There's, uh, there's, there's definitely a time for gathering and a time for scattering. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, you know, like, any any blog or any podcast or whatever they talk about having your niche and so so mine is about how to help scatter yeah um, not just get but you know i mean i've been doing this in may it'll have been nine years wow. and, and this whole kicking people out of the upper room thing it only came to me in the last year or two that that's wow. that's kind of what i do you know i think of things as afterthoughts often more than you know like vision ahead of time <laughs> you know what i mean and um when i just look at the type of people i've been able to to talk to and have on like yourself what the common thread is or what kind of guest i typically talk to and it's like yeah let's you know we're kicking people out of the upper room you know go go do something with uh with that fire and yeah uh, so a lot of it is an afterthought but yeah. um well i'm gonna I, i'm gonna call this quits and uh just chat a little bit with you and uh but um yeah thanks for being on on my my show you know i Sometimes forget that I'm just sitting here at a desk down in Peru and, uh, and that, you know, but people are going to listen to this, you know, and people like you take the time to, to be on it. And I'm grateful for that. Oh, it's, it's an honor to do that. Any, anytime, again, I sense now in this season more, more than ever, um, because there's, you know, like you're talking about, you kind of uh, assign language to, you know, it may take nine years, but it's like, okay, this is kind of what I do. And, you know, it's been goodness since, I mean, for just talking about what I've been talking about. It really is. It's it's restoring the awe and the wonder and and the unrestricted power of Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm all about revival, all about the signs and wonders, healing, prophecy. But we have none of that without Holy Spirit, and we can't have Holy Spirit on our terms. Mm-hmm. We need him on His terms. Right. So that's it. Well, I can't think of a better way to to end. So, uh, uh, God bless you, everybody. We hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast, you can find us in iTunes or on Stitcher Radio or directly at fireonyourhead.com for more options. If you want to support Steve and Lily Brimner as missionaries in Peru or find out more about what they do, be sure to head over to their blog at stevebrimner.com or check out Steve's Kindle books on Amazon and leave reviews of the ones you liked. See you next time.